My name is TJ Butler. I'm the Director of Growth and Outreach, and I'm so, so excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, this has been a message uh, that I've had done for probably a month, and um, if you ever have to write a message, I would, I would encourage you not to wait or not to get it done that early, because I could tell you that as I was studying through the notes this week again, my wife and I were looking over them. Uh, she's giving me tips, as she always does. Makes me better. Um, over the last month or so, I've been tested on every single one of these sermon points. And um, it's been something that there have been times where, you know, it just feels like, man, I need this more than anybody else. So as, as we talk about these notes this morning, if there's a little bit more uh, passion or a little bit more energy behind it, it's because I'm talking to myself today. Because I need this as much as anybody else needs it. We've, uh, we've started this, or we're wrapping up this series called This Is Us. And we've walked through various things. This is us grieving. This is us filled with hope. And today we're going to talk about this is us celebrating. As we move forward into 2019 and we say goodbye to 2018, it's a time of year where we all have our resolutions. We all have some things that we want to put behind us. We all have some things that we wish we could hold on to. But the fact of the matter is time doesn't slow down for any of us, right? We were just talking last night as we were taking down our Christmas decorations. Man, this holiday season has flown by. So as we move into 2019, we can trust and hope that God's got so much in store for us, no matter what kind of year 2018 was. So we'll jump right into it. If you look there in your message guide, we're going to establish what celebrating is and what celebrating isn't, just so we're all clear as we move forward here and talk about this is us celebrating. The purpose of celebrating, right there in your message guide, the purpose of celebrating is not to brag about how great I am or use my victories to show off or make others feel inferior. I know I'm guilty of this sometimes. You pray for God to give you something, he answers, and then you take the credit for it. That's not what the purpose of celebrating is. The purpose of celebrating is, however, to express gratitude to God and reinforce that I know that I can do whatever he has called me to do because he has been faithful in every battle I've faced so far. One of the reasons that we need to celebrate is because life is hard. Celebrating gives us strength. And if we don't stop and take the time to celebrate, we get worn out and we're not ready to fight the next battle. We're not ready to run the next leg of the race. So our first fill in there is life is hard and faith is hard. We're going to read through some scripture here in just a minute that kind of... uh, rebuffs the, this idea that some of us have that if we become Christians, everything is sunshine and palm trees. Life is hard and faith is hard. And I hear some of you, some of you laughing because you know, oftentimes when we start walking with Christ, that's when things get a little bit more difficult. And I believe the whole purpose in that is because God will do everything he possibly can to draw us closer to himself. And if that means that we have to go through some struggles and go through some valleys, he'll do it. He'll let us walk through those because He'll be right there with us walking. So we're going to read here in Psalm 77, starting in verse 1. And it's not in your message guide, but it'll be up here on the screens. There's also a free stack of Bibles in the back over there. This psalm was written by a guy named Asaph. Asaph was a high-ranking official, a music official in King David's court. So no doubt he had seen a lot of mighty works of God being that close to King David. And even he, you know, and, and obviously he was, he was well, well enough respected uh, for some of his own writings to end up in the Bible. So 2,000 years later, 3,000 years later, we're still looking at some of his writings. So this is a guy who is a strong, is strong in his faith, and yet this is what he has to say in Psalm 77, starting in verse 1. I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven, but my soul was not comforted. Have you ever been there where you're praying and praying and praying and it just doesn't feel like God's there? It doesn't feel like you're getting any answer. You're not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed, longing for his help. You don't let me sleep. I am too distressed to even pray. How many of you have been to that point where I've tried praying and it didn't work? And I'm too distressed to even keep praying because I feel like you didn't answer. It goes on to say, I think of the good old days 
long since ended, when my nights were filled with joyful songs, I search my soul and ponder the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Sometimes we get caught up in the good old days, right? And I know we have a tendency to remember the past sometimes better than it really was because the past is done. The past, past isn't scary anymore because the past is done and we've already seen the ending. Thank God, though, we serve a God who sees the ending now. He knows what's being written. It's already written in his book. So we can look forward and, and lean on his strength to know that just when we look back to the past in our own lives and think, Man, it was, those were the good old days. God wants us to look at our todays and say, you're living the good old days right now. Will he never be kind, again kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? This is a guy, again, who saw firsthand the miracles of God and the power of God through King David. And even he is crying out in desperation, saying, where are you, God? Where are you? This is proof that faith is hard. Just because we've accepted Christ, just because we're part of God's family, doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect. So here are some ways moving forward that we are going to focus on how we can celebrate moving in to uh, 2019. The first one there, if you look in your message guide, celebrate God's past faithfulness. We'll pick up in verse 11 right after that rant, that complaining that Asaph was doing. Where are you, God? Have you forsaken me forever? Have you turned your face on me? Are your promises failed? This is a pattern throughout the Psalms, and it brings me comfort to know that these guys can think this, but then one verse later, it shows that you have the power, that we have the power, to shift our perspective and stop focusing on the negative and turn our focus to the positive. Up on the screen, you'll see in verse 11, Asaph writes, but, and I love the word but in the Bible, because just when you're down for the count, there's always that but. So, but, then I recall all that you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts, and I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Can I call a timeout and say, it's nice to know that somebody else can be as unstable in their emotions as I can sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Two seconds ago, <laughs> it was the end of the world. Now he remembers God's faithfulness. Right? Just goes to show again that that's a choice that we can make, consciously an effort and a choice that we can put in to remember God's faithfulness. Uh, they are constantly in my thoughts, I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. You, oh God, your ways are holy, and is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. And then he goes back and he remembers a very specific time in the Israelite history. When the Red Sea saw you, O oh God, its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. And he's referring back to when Moses and the Israelites are facing this Red Sea in front of them and the mighty armies of Pharaoh behind them. And it looks like they've reached the end of the road. And then the oceans or the, the, the waters of the Red Sea see God, they hear God's voice, and they start to quake. The clouds poured down rain, and the thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The, the lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway that no one knew was there. You led your people through the sea, I'm sorry, you led your people along the road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. So Asaph is looking back and he's saying, you were there for us then. And I'm going to choose, rather than dwell on my negative current circumstances, I'm going to choose to remember your faithfulness of the past. If God can part a body of water 
and reveal a path that no one knew was there to keep his people safe. I think he can do the same for us. So we need to look back and celebrate God's past faithfulness as a way to encourage us in our present. I talked a couple weeks ago uh, about, when I was up here, I talked about a, the proof positive list that I have. And there were a lot of people that came up to me and said, hey, I'm going to try that. The whole point of the proof positive list, and if you weren't here, then I'll explain it to you. You start a, jur- a journal, it can be handwritten, it can be electronic, and every day or every week or even every month, you just write down something that proved God's faithfulness in your life. Because when you get into those moments like Asaph was in, in verses 1 through 10, where I don't hear God's voice anymore, I don't feel God's presence around me, I'm praying and crying out to him, and it doesn't seem like he's there, it helps to be able to look back and have proof that, oh yeah, he was there. He was there all along. My current circumstances may not make me feel that way, but feelings are a lie. And God's per- God, the proof of God's faithfulness is right here in black and white that I can read. Now, writing your own proof positive list is up to you. But the good news is, is that even if you don't want to write your own proof positive list, the Bible is a proof positive list of God's faithfulness to his people from the beginning of time. And even when they repeatedly turned their backs on him, he stopped at nothing to chase them back down and bring them back to him. And that's the same God that we serve today, and he's still doing the same things today in all of our lives. Because if we're honest, every single one of us turns from God to one degree or another. Things are going good. God has answered my prayers. Okay, God, I can handle it from here. But God loves us too much to let us live like that continuously. He brings us back to him by any means necessary. If you look in Joshua 4, that is going to be in the message guide. Starting in verse 20, we're going to talk about the Israelites a little bit more. They are right on the verge of going into the promised land now. Joshua is leading them. Moses has died. Joshua is leading them into the promised land. And God has commanded Joshua to do something very specific, something that I think we can learn a little bit something from this morning. In verse 20, it says, It was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, In the future, your children will ask, What do these stones mean? Then you will tell them, This is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes and kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. He did this so that the nations of the earth might know the Lord's hand is powerful. So God had commanded Joshua after he dried up another river for them to get across. He said, get 12 guys, one, one leader from each tribe of Israel. Have them take stones out of that river, and we're going to stack those up as a memorial to remember what I brought you through. Because I think it's so easy for us to forget what God has done. It's so easy for us to take the blessings like a handout and then move on to the next thing and worry about, okay, God, you gave me that. What are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And we forget These stones that he told them to collect were not to be worshipped. The stones themselves were not to be the idol. They were to be a reminder of the power of God so that they, they could bring their children back and they could point to them. And when the children asked, what's with the stones? They could say, this is proof. This is to remind us that there was a body of water rushing in front of us, keeping us from the promises of God. And when we thought there was no way God opened the sea, God opened the river, and let us all walk across on dry ground. And I think there's something to that too. The rivers didn't start rushing again until they had all crossed over. See, God's not a God who leaves anybody behind. God chases after. We sing a song, Reckless Love, where it talks about he leaves the 99 to find the one. So if you're that one this morning, know that God will keep that river parted until you walk through. The responsibility, though, lies on you and on me to take those steps and walk across on our own, knowing that he's there making the way. 
So what are your stones from 2018? What are the things that you can point back to from 2018 and say, yep, God was there? For me and my family, I can look back to January of last year when we accepted the position to come on staff full-time at Cross Point. It was scary. It was a big change for us. But that's a stone that we can point to and say, that was a turning point in our lives. God was calling us to do something that was outside of our comfort zone, that was far outside of our ability to do, but he was faithful. He gave a command, and we obeyed. Now, I wish I could say we obey all the time, but in that case, he did it, and he proved his faithfulness. I can point to August when our son started kindergarten. That's a stone. That's a stone I'm going to put there, because you always wonder how your kid's going to act when he's around a bunch of other people. <laughs> He's been great at daycare because he's been at his grandma's house, right? <laughs> but when he gets around other people, how's he going to act? That's a stone we're going to look back on and say, God, you were faithful. <laughs> you were faithful, and I know it wasn't because of anything we did. Because that boy has a mind of his own and a will of his own. I can look back to September. When my wife and I were able to go away to uh, the Weekend to Remember Marriage Conference. A time where we could just get away from the kids, where we could get away from the responsibilities and just focus on the first friendship that God called us to was with each other. It was a weekend where we could refresh and recharge and build the most important earthly relationship that he's entrusted to us. See, he has to be number one, but then we have to be right there as a top priority amongst humans. The kids don't take precedence. Jobs don't take precedence. Money, finances, none of that takes precedence. And that was a stone that we can look back on and say, God, you provided that. You provided a way for us to build what you've given us. So what are your stones from 2018? You can find at least one. And like I said, we don't worship the stones themselves, but we worship the God who gave us the stones. The next thing we'll do as far as celebrating is we will celebrate today. And I know for me, this might be the hardest one out of all the fill-ins I have on the, thing, on the uh, message guide today. Celebrate today. See, I'm a what-if thinker. I'm a planner. And a lot of times I can catch myself getting caught up in these hypothetical future scenarios. And it robs you of today. In Matthew 6, verse 34, and this is one that I constantly have to go back to and remind myself, it says, so don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And like I said, over the last four weeks since I've had this sermon done, God's tested me in some of these areas. And I've talked with a couple people, not by accident, who are having this same struggle. So I think it's worth talking about for just a second. God gives us the grace we need for the battle we're fighting now. And if we try to use up the grace for today on tomorrow, we are going to wear ourselves out. Use up all the grace God gave you for today. You know why? Because the Bible says his mercies are new every day. The grace for tomorrow will be there when you get it or when you need it. Use up the grace for today and don't spend all your time and energy trying to focus on the what ifs of tomorrow when God's put something right in front of you today that you need to take care of. We have a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old at home, and uh, so a lot of the times on our TV, if our TV's on, it's cartoons, so I'm going to do a cross point first here. I'm going to quote Kung Fu Panda, because <laughs> here's the thing that I found. If I don't get in the word as much as I should, God will speak to me through Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> so here's a quote from Kung Fu Panda that as I was preparing this sermon, it spoke to me. I said, oh, okay, God. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why they call it present. Whew, who knew Kung Fu Panda had so much wisdom? <laughs> but isn't it the truth? Yesterday's gone. There's nothing we can do about it. And to be honest with you, there's very little we can do about tomorrow. There's some things we do today that can set us up. But at the end of the day, what's going to happen is going to happen. It's all part of God's plan. Today is what we've been given. I might not even wake up tomorrow. 
Today is what I've been given. It's a gift. That's why they call it the present. So can I focus on today and use up the grace God gave me for today? One of the prayers we say every morning with our kids before we leave the house is, thank you, God, for the breath in my lungs. Every morning we've gotten into this habit, thank you, God, for the breath in my lungs. And it's because we want them to grow up to understand that today is not something to be taken for granted. And oftentimes it takes a tragedy, it takes an unexpected death of somebody near to you or somebody in our community to make us stop and realize, hey, that's true. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. My wife is the most optimistic person on the planet, so she doesn't look at it as like, oh, somebody could die. She always tells me, don't worry about tomorrow. Jesus could come back tomorrow. So don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. But I think one of the things uh, that we struggle with and that makes us discontent is we live by these whens and untils in our lives. When this happens, then I'll be okay. If I can just get to this amount of money in my bank account, then I'll be okay. If we can just get the kids to the point where they're out of diapers, then we'll be okay. Things will be so much easier. If we can just get, you know, and and fill in the blank. If I just get this possession, or if I just get to this point in my life, or if we just get through this, then it'll be better. And that robs us of today, and it causes that discontent in us. Because the truth is, when we get to that, whatever it was, there's always going to be something next. There's always going to be another when or until in our life. So I would encourage you today just to step back and and look at what are those wins and untils in your life. The things that you've got yourself convinced that once those happen, then everything will be okay. I know for me, early on, it it was when it came to giving or tithing, it was, you know, well, when you get a a full-time job, you know, right now I'm a college student. When I get a full-time job, then I'll... But the truth of the matter is, if I'm not going to trust God now with what I've got now, how am I going to be faithful to him later when I've got more? He who can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. I think one key to contentment and peace is celebrating God. And that's what we're talking about today. Celebrating him for the season he is walking you through now. Even if it's a difficult season, he's walking us through it for a reason. My favorite verse in the Bible, Romans 8, 28, it says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you truly believe that, then we trust that even if it doesn't feel good right now, it still is good. In the end, it still is good. Temporary pain leads to permanent glory later on. The Bible says it's not even worth comparing the future and what God has in store with us is not even worth comparing to the things we go through today. So focus on today. Focus on living what God has called us for today. Celebrate the fact that you have breath in your lungs today and you have a purpose and a plan. God has a purpose and a plan for you today. The next thing we'll talk about is, and this is another difficult one for me, celebrate progress, not perfection. When it comes to New Year's resolutions, we often get these big grand plans. You know, I'm going to completely cut out soda when I've been addicted to soda for the last 10 years. I'm going to completely, I'm going to eat no, no junk food. I'm going to run five miles a day when you've not run in 10 years. <laughs> and then we fail and we give up because we didn't reach that level of perfection, right? I'm a perfectionist. I don't know about you. But to me, success often happens when I feel like I've perfected it. Unfortunately, there's very few situations where I've perfected anything. And just when you think you've got one area perfected, you know, it's like you're trying to plug leaks. You got this one covered, and then this one sprouts up, and now you look like you're on a twister board (laughs) trying to get things, you're stuffing gum in this hole, huh? We've got to learn to celebrate progress instead of perfection. And that's another uh, place where that proof positive list will come in. Because I can look back and see, man, I used to struggle with this. I know I was struggling with that. But man, look at all these weeks that have gone by where it wasn't quite as bad. And we celebrate progress instead of perfection. In Exodus 23, verse 30, this is again God talking to the Israelites. 
And they're standing on the, on the verge of the promised land, and they've sent some spies in, and the spies come back and they say, we can't go in there. There's giants there. There's armies there that are way bigger, way stronger than us. And God's telling them, did I promise you or did I not promise you? I told you it would be yours. Why are you doubting me? As a consequence, they wandered for the next 40 years until that whole generation died off except for two guys who came back and said, we can take it because God said we could take it. But even as they were getting ready to walk in, this is what God says to them concerning those giants, those armies. I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, and I know that in my life it's been true, this is how God works. Little by little. I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. We serve a father, a loving God, who doesn't want to set us up for failure. God's not going to give me a million dollar bank account when he knows I can't handle a million dollars. God's not going to give me the marriage that I was looking for if I'm not ready for it. God's not going to give us kids until we're ready for it. If you can ever be ready for it. (laughs) But we serve a God who sets us up little by little to take possession of the things he's promised us. And a lot of times you'll hear that promise or you'll feel that promise early and then there's that waiting period in between where the little by little is taking place. But if our only measuring stick for success is perfection, then we will miss out on the blessings that God is giving us in the little by little. Take each step with God and trust that the next step will be made clear. As we were driving here, I don't know how it was when you were driving here. When I was driving here this morning, the fog was so bad I could barely see 10 feet in front of me. But in those situations, it's kind of like life, right? You turn on the headlights and you drive those 10 feet and you trust that, okay, God will make the next 10 feet close. Then he'll make the next 10 feet close. Then he'll make the next 10 feet clear for me. And then I can look back and before you know it, I've traveled a mile but I did it little by little, and I didn't try to attack the whole thing at one time. Because if I'm looking too far ahead, and I miss the 10 feet in front of me, that's where we get into trouble. That's where we miss out on the blessings in the present moment. The other thing that I want to talk about when it comes to taking progress as success and not perfection comes straight from the Lord's Prayer. If you've been in church any amount of time, you're probably familiar with the Lord's Prayer, but this is how Jesus taught his disciples. This is how you should pray. And one of the lines in that is, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say give us this day our yearly bread or give us all this bread at one time. Because I think what what we're saying when we ask God to give us the whole thing at once is, give me enough so that I don't have to trust you anymore. And God's saying, no, no, no. I'm going to give you your daily bread. Trust me for your daily bread. And don't worry about tomorrow's bread. Because I want you to trust me. Not your money. Not even your ability to work. Not your own strength. Trust me that I'll give you what you need just for today. Last thing I'll say about this before we move on. And we talk about it. It's one of our core values here is excellence. And this is what I came across in studying for this. The difference between perfection and excellence. Perfection is an impossible standard because so much of the result in anything we pursue is out of our control. But excellence is doing the best I can with what I've been giving and trusting that the results are part of God's plan for our lives. I have an index card over my desk that says, obedience is my part, the results are God's. And it has to be there for me to look at every day because I know that I'll wander from that, and I'll try to control the outcome. When God never or called me to control the outcome, all he asked me to do was drive that 10 feet, and I'll take care of the outcome. The last fill in there on our message guide is celebrate the future with hope. Celebrate the future with hope. 
Now, I know I just spent some time saying, don't look too far ahead. But I think there is something to looking towards the future with hope. And I think one of the greatest lies that the enemy tells us is whatever your current situation is now is just how it's always going to be. And that can be dangerous on both sides. If things are going great for you now, you start to get a little complacent. And you start thinking, well, this is just how things are always going to be. The money is always going to be good. My relationships are always going to be good. The kids are always going to behave well. I'm always going to have this job. And that's when we start to take things for granted. And that's when we start to rely on ourselves more than we start to rely on God. The flip side of that is, if our current circumstances are full of struggle, full of pain, we can think, this is just how it's always going to be. And that mindset, I think, is, is one place where the enemy or even our own flesh tries to keep us because it causes us to give up on the plan and the purpose and the calling that God has for our lives. See, if I can come, become convinced that today is how every day is going to be, and I'm in the midst of a valley right now, then where's my hope for tomorrow? What's the point of even fighting any, any further or any harder? Because it's just always going to be the way it is now. But like Sherry said in her prayer this morning during Connect Cards, we serve a God of grace who looks at us with all our imperfections and filters it through the blood of Christ and sees perfection. It says that when we meet God one day face to face, we will be completely pardoned from our sins. As far as the east is from the west, they won't even be, won't even be remembered because of the blood of Christ. So I would just say, look toward the future with hope. The way things are today is not how things are always going to be. But the God who is here today is the God who's going to be with us tomorrow. Pastor Paul sent us an email a couple weeks ago and just posed this question to us. It God, can, can God be on the move, right? We have song, a song that, that's out there on the radio, God is on the move. Can God really be on the move when God is everywhere, right? The fact of the matter is, God isn't just walking side by side with us. God is already there. Whatever the future is, God is already there making a way for us. And in moments of struggle, that brings me peace and comfort to know that it's not some arbitrary, left up to chance scenario of what's going to happen tomorrow. My God, my Father, is already there making a way for me. So I'm going to celebrate the future with hope. Philippians 3 Verse 13, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved it. It's a guy who's it's a big deal. He's a big deal. But he says, I haven't achieved anything. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what is ahead. And when he's talking about forgetting the past, he's not talking about forgetting everything God's done. We already established that, right? We need to have those stones that we can look back to. He's talking about, forget all the mistakes you've made. Forget the shortcomings. Forget the failures. That doesn't define who you are. What you did when you were a teenager doesn't define who you are. What you did when you were in college doesn't define who you are. How your first marriage turned out doesn't define who you are. What you did yesterday doesn't define who you are. God says who you are. And if you are a child of God who has accepted Christ as your Savior, God says you are free, you are forgiven, and there is no condemnation for you. So uh, Apostle Paul then says, uh, forgetting the past and looking forward to what is ahead, I press on to reach the end. I don't quit. All throughout the New Testament, there's this theme of endurance and perseverance. And God promises rewards to those who don't give up. I remember seeing a comic strip one time, and if you can picture this, it was a miner digging through this this deep minefield, and the, the other side was right there. And you could see how he had tunneled through all this way. 
And then he turned around and gave up right when he was at the end. I want to encourage you, if you're right, just about to give up, and I don't know what giving up looks like for you, about to give up hope on, on the kids, about to give up on your marriage, maybe about to give up on life in general, it would stink to be like that miner who only needed one or two more swipes of the pickaxe to see the light come shining through that he had made it. It sounds corny, but the, you know, the old phrase, it's always darkest before the dawn. Your breakthrough could be right around the corner. Don't give up. Don't give up. Take one more step and trust God. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. No matter what kind of year 2018 was for you, I can promise you, and you know it if you've been at Cross Point any amount of time, that we truly believe the best is yet to come. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager or if you're 95 years old. God's best for you is yet to come because of what he has prepared for those of us who are his children. If you look there at your uh, message guide or your connect card that Sherry talked about, we're going to talk about our next steps. Next step number one, and this is always our next step number one, because this is the whole reason Cross Point Church exists. It's the whole reason the church as a whole exists. I will accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. In Isaiah 28, verse 16, it says, Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And we talked about stones earlier. God has something else to say about stones. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It's a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes needs never be shaken. That's Jesus. The cornerstone of our lives, the cornerstone of our faith, the only stone that is safe to build on that will cause us to never be shaken is Jesus. And these words were written hundreds of years before Jesus even stepped foot on this planet. That birth that we just celebrated last week, these foretold what Jesus would be. He's our cornerstone. So even if you can't think of any stones of your own to build on for 2018, you can start today while we still have a couple days left in 2018 and get out the only stone you'll ever need and start building your life from this point forward on it. If you feel like God is speaking to you this morning and you want to surrender to him and you want to say, I've been building my house, I've been building my life on stones that keep cracking and I'm tired of it. I want to build my life on the one stone that will stand forever. If that's you this morning, with every eye closed and every head bowed, say this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving me even when I don't deserve it, Lord. Thank you for coming into this earth as a baby to dwell amongst us and grow into a man who would willingly Submit himself to beatings and death on a cross out of love for me. Lord, I pray that you would be my Lord and my Savior. I accept your love. I accept your grace. I ask for forgiveness for my sins and trust that your blood is the only thing that could pay for them. From this day forward, Lord, I know I won't be perfect but I just want to be yours and I want to build my life on you. I'm yours forever. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time today, I just want to say welcome home. Welcome to God's family, the only family you'll ever need, honestly. Because we know that as people, we're going to let each other down. But as God's child, The Bible is full of promises that apply to you of a God who will never let you down. So if you said that prayer for the first time, if you wouldn't mind, please just check that off on your Connect card. We don't want to bother you. We just want to be able to give you the resources 
and the next steps that you need as you start your journey of faith, and it'll be the greatest journey that you ever go on in your life. Next step number two, I will celebrate blank. There's four things that we can celebrate there that we talked about today in your message guide. I will celebrate God's past faithfulness. Do you need to build some stones? Do you need to start a proof positive list? What do you need to do to commemorate God's faithfulness? Or maybe you're saying, I will celebrate today. I'm going to stop living in yesterday. I'm going to stop living in the glory days of old. And I'm going to stop living in the future in these hypothetical what-if scenarios that get me nowhere but exhausted. I'm going to celebrate today, just like Kung Fu Panda said. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Do I need to celebrate progress instead of perfection? Do I need to be able to just see that God allowed me to take one step and I didn't need to run the whole race now? See, a lot of times we hear life is a marathon, not a sprint. But I think there's a little bit of a falseness to that. I think life is a series of interrelated sprints. Because the truth is, none of us can run all the time. But God gives us enough grace to run this leg of the race. And then we stop and we celebrate. Thank you, God, that you got me through that leg of the race. Now I can run the next leg. And when I get to the end of that leg, I'm going to stop and celebrate again. And I'm not going to try to run this whole marathon and wear myself out without taking time to stop and thank you for what you've done in the previous leg of the race. So do you need to celebrate progress instead of perfection? And the last one, maybe you need to celebrate the future with hope. I know that there's some of us this morning that may not feel like 2019 is going to be any different than 2018. Why would it be? 2017 wasn't any different. But we serve a God of hope. And whenever he's involved, there is always a promise that the best is yet to come. Next step, number three, I will keep a proof positive list. I just touched on that. But again, it doesn't have to be something that becomes this rule or ritual or this thing that's meant to to stress you out. You don't have to do it every day. And you don't have to do it every week even, but maybe once a month. How many months are in a year? 12? How many stones did God tell Joshua's men to grab? 12. Maybe that's not a coincidence. Maybe you just start in 2019 once a month collecting a stone. Something that you can set up to remember God's faithfulness to you in that month. The last next step is I will memorize Philippians 3.14. Scripture is the most powerful weapon God gives us. And it's crazy how every time you find yourself in a situation, if you've got the scripture memorized, I don't need access to Wi-Fi on my phone. I don't need to have my Bible with me the Holy Spirit will prompt that scripture to come to mind just when I need it the most. This is why we always give a memory verse. Philippians 3, verse 14 says, I press on to the end of the race to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. To sum that up is, don't give up. Don't give up. Hope is around the corner. And God is already there at the next step, working everything out for our good and for his glory. In just a second, we're going to do our offering. And again, Pastor Wayne says it every week, give as you've already decided in your heart to give. And you know, God doesn't need anything from us. He allows us to be part of it. And it's never about the money. It's more about our faithfulness and our willingness to trust God. But I did want to give you some exciting news. We've been doing our Christmas offering the month of December. The goal was 10,000. We gave an update on Christmas Eve, but we've gotten even more since then. The goal was 10,000, and we're over 20,000 now. God is good and God is faithful. And you guys proved to be faithful as well through this offering because that's above and beyond your normal ties. 
And now there are organizations, there are initiatives here at Crosspoint, and there are families in our community whose lives will forever be changed because of your sacrifice. So thank you so much for that. As we enter into our time of worship, don't go anywhere. This song that, that they're about to play is one of my favorite songs. And it talks about running out of the grave, literally running out of the grave. See, the fact is we were all dead. And God saved us. And now we can get up and run out of the grave. And there's no better news than that. And there's no better hope than that to march into 2019 with. Let us close in prayer. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word and your faithfulness, Father. Thank you that as we move into 2019, Lord, we know that you're already there. That you've already got things planned for 2019. And whether it's going to be the greatest year of our lives so far, or whether we're about to walk into a struggle, Lord, that we don't even see coming, we can trust and believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are going to be there with us, walking us through and working everything for our good and your glory. We love you so much, Father, and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.